Yeah, just a little background about us, why we do this. I'm going to give you a little background. We are GEM Physio or Global Initiative for Expert Manual Therapists. We started this initiative because I graduated from University of Delhi, India, and then moved to States in 2008, having lived in States for a long time and worked in States for a long time and worked with brilliant minds. I realized that there is a huge, huge, huge difference in the way we were taught back in India and taught here. Okay. And more and more research is coming out. We are a fastly evolving field. We started with bachelors in the US, then masters, and then doctorate. And now we have postdoctoral fellowships and residences with a lot of a lot of new research coming out every year. And we are just fine-tuning our skill set so that we can we can we we can modify our treatments and we can make make it better. Okay. And uh, we we have a couple of cohorts running right now. We do teach a one year program and uh, we try to try try to introduce intricate concepts so that people who are in the program know where the field is going they can treat patients very in an evidence based manner they can use cutting edge manual skills they can use clinical reasoning because that i think more than everything i think it's a clinical reasoning which 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 is missing and uh, and combination of these three things, clinical reasoning, evidence-based literature, and manual skills, you can become a very potent force in the clinic because you'll be treating patients in the clinic which others are missing. You'll be, you'll be helping a lot of people if you have a better understanding of what they are presenting with, okay? A lot of people who have gone through our program, they can tell you that they are like superstar PTs. They do a fantastic job. They treat patients, which everybody misses. And that's that's the bottom line because you know more, you do better, you 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 treat better, you help more, and and that's how the world works, right? If you know more, you earn more, you do better, right? And I mean, and it's about helping patients. I mean, that's why we do this job, right? And so, this these are our social media handles. You can reach out to Dr. Dhrumi. She does a fantastic job in, in answering your queries, answering questions. Yeah, this is me and this is Dr. Steve. Dr. Steve is my partner in crime. He does a fantastic job in explaining things and doing a lot of hands-on stuff. We are planning to come to India for, for six, seven days in Delhi and in Bombay, and we'll be teaching a lot of hands-on skills. Yeah. If you want details on that, uh, talk to Dr. Dhrumi. People who are in cohort one and two, they will find some of the connection of today's lecture with stuff we have already taught. Yeah. Yeah. I think without further ado, I'm gonna I'm gonna start and just pay attention. And if you want me to stop somewhere and re-explain this, this is a very, very heavy lecture. And uh, I was having this conversation with Dr. Dhrumi, and I can tell you that having a neuroscience degree helps me understand this a little bit better, but not a lot of you would have a neuroscience graduate degree. So I'll try to simplify things, but the key thing here is I will go slow. I'll make sure that I stop and try to explain it, try to dumb it down, try to uh, try to make sense of it, okay? And uh, we'll talk a little bit about this condition and we'll try, we'll talk about treatment ideas and stuff, okay? We'll post this lecture on YouTube always so that you can go back and relook at it, okay? And re-listen to it if you're working out in the gym or if you're walking outside or if you're driving or if you're going to work, you can always listen to it because this is, this is a little complex stuff and they call it complex regional pain syndrome because a lot of researchers had a hard time explaining this, okay? And we'll talk a little bit about history, a little, little bit about how this how the understanding of understanding of this condition has evolved, okay? Yeah. Okay, so the definition is, and this is definition comes from International Association for Study of Pain. Pain, chronic pain, acute pain, subacute pain has been like redefined by International Association for Study of Pain so many times. And this condition, has been redefined. We're going to talk a little bit about history, 
But this condition has been redefined and reintroduced again and again because we still lack, we still don't know a whole lot, though we know a whole lot. Okay. So the definition is this is a chronic pain condition. Okay. Chronic pain condition, which has you have spontaneous evoked regional pain, which means that you have local pain which comes out of nowhere, which usually don't correlate in magnitude with the tissue injury. Okay. So whenever we do a subjective exam, we look at what kind of injury patient had. And in our head, we see, oh, this patient had this kind of injury. This is the kind of pain this person really should present with. But not in this case. Because the correlation between the type of injury and the amount of pain patient is presenting don't match. Yeah? The patient is presenting way more symptoms than you would anticipate with other patients with similar injury. Yeah. Yeah. Giving you a little bit of history how this condition has evolved. So if you know a little bit about American history, this country had a civil war back in 1860s. And people who were, who were shot during the war were was reporting like a lot of pain years after the years after the incident. So Dr. Silas Weir Mitchell called it, the first one who identified this consider called it cosalgia. That was a term that was used back in the 1860s. Okay. The idea behind the, behind the diagnosis was that there is some unknown pain that continues to linger despite the primary problem being fixed. Okay. And then research followed in 1901. Paul Sudek found that this condition, cosalgia, also had some bone atrophy, some findings of osteopenia. And he gave a term called pseudex atrophy. That came, I mean, you've heard of pseudex atrophy. So, cosalgia was primarily focused on kind of a nerve condition, nervous system condition, but Paul Sudek said, no, this is also a kind of a bone condition. If your bone is getting involved, bone is getting atrophied. The research followed. 1936, Evans found the involvement of sympathetic nervous system. Yeah. And called it reflex sympathetic dystrophy or reflex sympathetic atrophy. So it was initially a nerve problem, then a bone problem, and then a, nervous system, a sympathetic nervous system problem. So this condition has just evolved over the period of time. Okay. And from 1936 to almost 1995, if you read old books, I remember t giving this lecture back in 2008. And I was talking about reflex sympathetic dystrophy and I did not look at a lot of literature back then. I just called it reflex sympathetic dystrophy because till 1995, we were calling it as a sympathetic nervous system problem. That something has gone wrong to the sympathetic nervous system. And that's why you're presenting with these kind of findings. But the problem came along when pain physicians started blocking, started using anti-blocking agents of the sympathetic nervous system, but the symptoms of the patient did not improve. So yes, this is a sympathetic nervous system problem. So if you block the sympathetic nervous system through, through drugs, patients should improve in symptoms, but it did not. In 1995, at a pain conference in Orlando, Florida, they gave coined this term called as complex regional pain syndrome, which means that it is not bone, it's not nerve, it's not muscle, it's not tissue. It is very complex. It has multiple factors that give you symptoms. Yeah, so does, it is not a bone problem. It's not a sympathetic system problem. There is more than one thing that is causing the symptoms. Okay, but what are those symptoms? Okay, we're going to talk about that. Okay. So there is a re reflex sympathetic dystrophy society or association in Chicago, 
which which talks about the difference between chronic pain and complex regional pain syndrome is presence of autonomic findings. So if you don't have any autonomic findings, then we're going to talk about autonomic findings in the symptoms. Okay. Okay. There are different terms that have been given, terminologies that have been given to this condition. Reflex neurovascular dystrophy, neuroalgodystrophy. Post stroke, it is called as shoulder hand syndrome. Okay, shoulder hand syndrome. And this is after stroke, your patients develop severe symptoms. We call it shoulder hand syndromes. Reflex sympathetic dystrophy comes from Dr. Sudeik's work. And then you have cosalgia from Dr. Mitchell's work. So this, this is a confused diagnosis because different people have different said different things at, in different eras. And there, there are a lot of unknowns. Okay. Talking about symptoms, and I think symptoms are very, very straightforward. The diagnosis is usually made by good subjective and objective examination. If you're paying attention to patient symptoms, talking to them, listening to their concerns, you will be able to make this diagnosis very easily because there is a clear criteria, which we're going to talk about in the future slides. But some of the symptoms could be, patient would have symptoms of hyperalgesia or allodynia. Hyperalgesia is symptoms are amplified. A touch symptom would feel like a stab or blowing air on the skin would feel like 10 on 10 pain. And that should not be the case, right? So that is called allodynia. So you have this amplification of the symptoms. Okay, More symptoms than you anticipate when you see a certain condition you can have, and I'm going to talk about, you can have a, a certain condition and you have this in this mind, okay, pain would come with five or six of pain, but this patient is presenting 10 on 10 pain with most activities, sometimes 10 on 10 pain with rest. Then it could be complex regional pain syndrome, but there are other criteria too, which we're going to talk about. So you have skin color changes, skin temperature changes, and now you have increased sweating response. Yeah. You can also have some swelling and I'll show you some pictures. So you will, once you see it, you will never forget it. Okay. And you can have like, because you can have altered patterns of hair. You can have, you can have a lot of hair loss. You can have increased nail growth. You can have motor findings where you have reduced strength. You can have tremors. You can have dystonia. Okay. So you can have a bunch of things, but there is a clear classification criteria, which we're going to talk about. Sweating response can increase and can also decrease. We're going to talk about that in the stages. Yeah. Okay. So these are the stages of CRPS. I could actually have like a lecture on stages of CRPS, but just trying to make it more simpler. So you have acute stage and then you have dystrophic stage and then you have atrophic stage. Acute stage is you have localized pain which is very severe. When you touch the extremity, it feels like hot. Okay, Your skin is dry and red and there is a decreased sweating response. Okay, And then x-rays look normal, usually first one to three months. After that disease progression, the swelling, the pain becomes from sharp and severe to a little more diffuse and throbbing and nagging and that does not go away. The extremity would, extremity would start looking cold and it would look like there is decrease in blood flow, like cyanotic, like bluish. Okay? But usually you will see patients because patients come to us when they, were, they are hurting a lot, right? Most patients come to us when they are in severe pain. So more often than not, you will see patients in the acute stages because they have, physician can't help them, pain management can't help them, They'll get like a sympathetic block. Nothing gets better. Say, go do go CPT. Because when doctors don't have a clue what to, what to be done, they just throw patients to us, right? So it can happen. I'm talking about shoulder. I think I spoke about shoulder hand syndrome. Shoulder hand syndrome is a common, common form of CRPS that is seen after, after hemiplegia or stroke. Yeah. 
But this is this is that's why complex regional pain syndrome is an umbrella term. There are a lot of conditions that come under complex regional pain syndrome. So your patient will be primarily when you see them will be in acute stages, okay? And this is a common thing you need to learn because these are the common epidemiology is important because that sometimes helps you when you're examining your patient, patient comes to you, you know from back of the head, this patient might have this condition just, just based on epidemiology. So more, more common in women, more females have like three to four times than men. More commonly in upper limb, peak incidence is later in life, 50 to 70. I have seen some young CRPS patients, but it's mostly later in life. Most commonly after fractures. Okay. Can anybody tell me which fracture is the most common for CRPS? Anybody? People who are in our master class. Can you guys tell me which fracture causes CRPS? Coley's. That's that's the that's the, that's the thing. Yeah, Coley's fracture, radiocarpal fracture, Coley's, any fracture around radius has a higher tendency of giving you CRPS. Okay. Other common conditions they have seen as to be associated with associated with this condition is Morton's neuroma or other foot surgeries. Okay. So you can have sprains, ankle sprains, you can have contusions, you can have crush injuries, you can have surgeries, and that can give you complex regional pain syndrome. Yeah, that can give you complex pain. American PT Association says that you get around 80,000 new cases every year. 80,000 new patients. So a lot of patients in the US, I'm sure way more than 80,000 in India. Yeah. So Okay. This is a clinical, clear clinical criteria. And when you're seeing these patients in the clinic, make sure that you follow. This is gold standard research. You can do x-rays, MRIs, sweat tests. We're going to talk about nerve involvement is there or not. And there is a demarcation. We're going to talk about that. Yes, there is a nerve involvement and there is a peripheral nerve injury. We're going to talk about that as we go along. Okay. So you have, there's a clear criteria given Budapest Diagnostic Criteria for CRPS. This came after 1995, very new research. Yeah. And so you're looking at a multiple subset, okay? multiple subsets here. So your patients will present with a lot of symptoms. I heard like 10 on 10. And when we're gonna talk about case studies, I think this will kind of be a refresher to this classification. You will have some sensory and motor findings, which happens usually in a kind of a nerve involvement, right? You see sensory, but you're going to also have like vascular involvement. You're going to have skin changes. You can have temperature changes. You'll have swelling. Okay. So from sensory, vasomotor, pseudomotor, which is edema, and motor changes and skin changes, out of these four, you should have at least three with at least one symptom. Either you have allodynia or hyperalgesia, okay? which is easy to find. Touch should feel like a stab, blowing cold air should hurt. That's allodynia for you. You can have like warm extremities in acute stages, subacute and chronic and have cold extremities. Okay? You can have like swollen looking limbs and I'll show you some pictures and that will make more sense. Okay? You can ha also have motor changes, which means decrease in strength, decrease in range of motion. And then you can also have trophic changes in male hair and skin. Okay. Let me show you a picture because I think that will make more sense. I think there are tons of pictures you can find on internet. So this is nothing, no rocket science, but yeah. So this is how your CRP patients look like. Okay. Make sure that you are differentiating them from from chronic pain, okay? Because chronic pain can also have symptoms, but this will have autonomic nervous system involvement. You can have like a pseudomotor involvement and vasomotor involvement, okay? And, yeah. Okay. Any questions till now, guys? Yeah. 
So you have at least one symptom of the three of the following categories. And then you also have to have one sign apart from, of course, pain, evidence of hyperalgesia to pinprick, evidence of allodynia to light touch. So you're reporting symptom and then you're doing kind of signs and symptoms are different guys. Symptoms is what patients report. Signs is what you find in your objective examination. Okay. Okay. Symptoms is what patients report. Signs is what you find. And you're doing too. So you're, you're looking at pain and then you're looking at what patient is reporting and then you're checking what patient is reporting. And you're checking for sensory, you're checking for motor, you're checking for pseudomotor and you're checking for motor findings. Right? Yeah. Make sure that you're using this criteria in the clinic. Don't call all the ankle sprain patients who have a little bit of swelling CRPS. And I've seen doctors do that. Okay. It's always unilateral involvement. Unilateral involvement is more common. I would not say always, but it has been seen in research that unilateral involvement is more common. Okay. Okay. So these are good pictures, self-explanatory pictures. You have four criteria. You're looking for at least one sign and one symptom. Four criteria are sensory, motor, pseudomotor, and vascular. Okay. And then you're looking for, for at least one symptom and one sign. How to differentiate? So not every swelling will be CRPS. Make sure that you're finding allodynia, hyperalgesia, increased symptoms. You're looking at this four categories. You're looking at the temperature. Any reason for more? I mean, but how, how often do you see bilateral injuries? Usually CRPS will have history of injuries involved with it. Okay. If you have bilateral injuries, you're going to have a bilateral involvement. Usually we get unilateral injuries and that's why you see the unilateral involvement. That's my best explanation to this. Okay. Yeah. So we spoke about acute, subacute, cr cr and, and, and chronic. And in atrophic stages, we spoke about how you have a lot of muscle atrophy contractures. And I'm coming back to this slide so that I can show you a picture of how atrophic and chronic looks like. Okay. And if you look at the chronic CRPS, this looks like, looks like this. You have a lot of atrophy. Okay. You have a lot of atrophy. Yeah. One of you were asking me about these type of symptoms are seen in rheumatoid arthritis, but with rheumatoid arthritis, you might not see allodynia and hyperalgesia. I don't think you will see allodynia and hyperalgesia. That's a difference. Huge difference. Yeah, you can, can have like multiple swollen li limbs. You might not see temperature change. In certain situations, you might see temperature change, but in most situations in RA, you won't see temperature change. Yeah. And you definitely won't see allodynia and hyperalgesia. Guys, there are no radiological examinations, sweat tests that can diagnose this condition. The criteria I discussed is the gold standard. I think sensitivity is 0.99 and specificity is 0.68. If you look at the... Why developed shoulder hand syndrome and hemiplegia? We'll talk about it. There are various theories and given and I'm going to... I'm just coming on to that. We're going to talk about this, why you're getting this kind, these kind of symptoms. Okay. This condition was like really poorly understood before 1995. In last 20, 25 years, 30 years, we have made like some head ground and we know a little more about this condition. Okay. So there is CRPS1 and then there is CRPS2. Okay. The CRPS1, there is no nervous system, no peripheral nerve involvement. Okay. So there is no peripheral nerve involvement in type 1, but in type 2, there is a peripheral nerve involvement. So you have a peripheral nervous system that is affected in type 2. How do you know that the peripheral nerve, how, how do we assess peripheral nervous system? Anybody? How do we assess if there's somebody has peripheral nerve injury? Anybody? If we have to differentiate between what do we have to do 
to know whether this person has a peripheral nerve injury. You, you're right. You're absolutely correct. Very smart. We will do have to do nerve conduction tests. There's no answer in CBEMG has to be done. So answering your question, in CRPS1, you're not going to have, you're going to have normal NCV findings. In CRPS2, you're going to have abnormal NCV findings. And that's how we differentiate between one and two. And the crazy thing is other symptoms match. Other symptoms are very similar in CRPS. You use the same criteria, Budapest criteria for CRPS1, CRPS2. Okay. Yeah? Okay, some of the theories given on causative factors. Okay, so this is another interesting, interesting stuff. Okay, so we have we have done our blame game over the years till since this condition was found. We blamed on the sympathetic nervous system, we blame it on a nerve, we blamed on the muscle, we blamed on the bone. But what the recent research literature says, and this article was published not very recently, but in 2015. So it talks about different criteria, talks about a kind of a multifactorial pathology. You have like multiple positive factors contributing to an umbrella condition. So you have a nerve injury, okay, which is only in co complex regional pain syndrome two, not in one. And then you have something called as ischemia reperfusion injury or oxidative stress. And what is this? Let me try to explain this. This is not very hard. So if you, for example, if you had a radius fracture, right, you had a radius fracture, you had bone injury, and you also had like a lot of tissue injury surrounding the bone, bone fracture or, or, or fracture that led to ischemia cut off in the blood supply in that tissue, followed by restoration of blood supply to that tissue. And that leads to increase in hypersensitivity of the tissue because you have this dead and necrotic tissue and the blood supply is restored. And there is an explanation to this. We're going to talk about what is happening at the cellular level. And that's why this, this lecture is at a higher complexity because this is just a very complex thing. Okay. So this is the second theory. The third theory was central sensitization. In our foundations lecture, we spend a lot of time on talking about central sensitization. I'm going to talk a little bit about central sensitization today also. And then there is a theory called as peripheral sensitization. The difference between central sensitization is, and peripheral sensitization is, in peripheral sensitization, there is a response of the nervous system at the site of injury. What happens at the site of injury after trauma. And then there is a response at the cortical level or a spinal cord level, and that is central sensitization. Yeah. People from GEM masterclass and people from cohort one and two, can anybody tell me dermatome and myotome assessment is what I was talking about when we were talking about Budapest criteria? Yeah. Can anybody tell me? What, this is simple. Can anybody tell me, especially from people from cohort one and two, what will happen with peripheral sensitization? I'm gonna talk about this in detail in coming slides. I'm just trying to test my people who have who are in cohort one and two and whether they understand this central and peripheral sensitization. Okay. Okay. Can you tell me what happens at, at the site of injury? Shut down the muscle. I'm talking about, if you go back to the foundation's lecture, we, we, had a, we had a conversation about peripheral sensitization. What happens when you have peripheral sensitization at, at the neural level? You guys remember the foundation's lecture? Sensory motor changes, these are symptoms and signs and symptoms. I'm not talking about signs and symptoms. I'm talking about what happens in peripheral sensitization at the micro level, at the site of injury. 
Anybody? You guys are not paying attention. People in the master class, people cohort one and two. We speak about this stuff all the time and it is important for you have to have the understanding because the more you know, the free radical activation is there, but that is not, that is more of a vascular problem than a neural problem. Okay. If I tell you, you guys will say, ah, I knew this. You guys remember more unimodal receptors at the site of injury? Man, you need to go back and look at the foundations lecture again. No, it doesn't have to do with pain gate theory. Pain gate theory has been outlawed already. I know in India, they still teach you that stuff. Pain gate theory is an outdated approach. No. So what is happening is, I'm going to talk about central and peripheral sensitization as we go along in this presentation. Okay. So, and then you have reduction in threshold and increase in magnitude. I like that answer. You're getting a lot of neuronal firing. Neurons are just firing, firing, firing. And the threshold of threshold required to fire has increased. And some research says that there are more receptors. There are more receptors after the injury. And this might be because of reperfusion, more blood supply being added to the tissue because the tissue is trying to heal. And then you add more nerve receptors because of the oxidative stress. You're adding more nerve receptors. So you have more nerve receptors, they're firing more, and then you have decreased threshold. And what will that do here? It will give you increased response, amplified. In neuroscience, they use a word called temporal summation. But the simple, simple term is that you're getting this increased firing, 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 firing. The nerve that cannot stop firing. And what, what, what happens when nerve can't stop firing? Patient says, my pain is 10 on 10. It doesn't matter what I do, I hurt. Okay. Okay, we're going to talk, as we go along, we're going to talk about peripheral sensitization. Again, what is happening here? And then we'll talk about central sensitization, what is happening here. Okay. What does the magnitude mean? Magnitude mean that whenever you have action potential, you remember the basic action potential? You go from resting membrane potential is minus 70. You go, you do polarization, you come back, right? That is your magnitude. The magnitude has increased. The magnitude has increased means that the firing pattern, the nerve, nerves at the peripheral site is firing much stronger, right? Much when they fire much stronger, and we are talking about nociceptors. We are talking about A delta and C. When the A delta and C are firing too much, what will happen? You're going to have like crazy amount of pain, and that's why these patients present with stupid pain. I mean, like they come to you and they say, I just hurt like hell. Okay. Okay. There has been a sympathetic nervous system involvement, and this has been going on for probably 1936 when Dr. Evans described it as a sympathetic nervous system problem. And then there are certain inflammatory markers also present at the site of injury. There are some brain changes that happen it's a reduction in pain threshold. It is also reduction in pain threshold. It's a combination of three things. Increase in number of receptors, nociceptors in that area. Second, reduction in the threshold. And third is increase in amplitude. So you have more receptors firing strongly and does, that does not require a lot of mechanical stimulus. What will happen? Allodynia. You touch and patients want, patient says, this feels like a stab. This feels so crazy. You blow like cold air. Patient feels like pain here. And that is because of the peripheral sensitization. Brain, body is just trying to protect because you have this oxidative stress. You have cut off of the circulation. You have this ischemic ischemia reperfusion. Okay. And your body is just trying to compensate for it. Okay. Okay. We're going to give you enough treatment ideas so that all this will make sense to you, okay? And then you have brain changes, you have 
genetic changes. And then you have research has shown that there are certain patient populations that are more predisposed to this condition. And we're going to talk about that also. Yep. Let's talk about acute CRPS and chronic CRPS. So acute CRPS, usually you will find spontaneous resolution within 13 months. Okay. Which means that the condition will get better with or without treatment. Okay. And that is that is encouraging because you will have your patient will go through hell, but they will like spontaneously, but over the course of 13 months, they will get better. Okay. But the problem is they come to you in acute stages, and you don't know whether this patient will what the trajectory of the disease is. It's like multiple sclerosis. When patients come to you during a flare-up, you don't know whether it's like relapsing remitting or primary progressive. Right, and that's why intervention is important because patients come to us when they're hurting a lot. Right, patients come to us when they're hurting a lot, and we have to treat them regardless what will happen a year from now. Some of the patients will get better with no treatment, but some of the patients will have contractures and dystrophy, dystrophic changes and atrophic changes years a year down the line. Okay. Okay. In chronic CRPS, you have lower chances of complete reversal without treatment. And that's why treatment matters. And that's why manual therapy matters. That's why your understanding matters. That's why what you know matters. And that's why, and that's how you can help these patients. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This was a speculative model given. Okay. Yeah. Speculative model given to explain CRPS, and I'll try to simplify it because this is very complex. Because multiple things are happening at multiple areas, and I'll try to basically dumb it down and try to explain each stage so that you understand what's going on. Okay. Okay. So you have injury in the wrist, Coley's fracture, Smith's fracture. What it does is it basically activates the pain pain mediators. You had like beta cell activation which is trying to heal. You had interleukin B, and then you had substance P. We know substance P. If you know pain gate theory, I don't want to go to pain gate theory because that has been outlawed multiple times. But you had substance P signaling because but the simple simple way of explaining this is you basically activated the pain pathways. Okay. But the problem here is especially with CRPS, you've not only activated pain pathways, but you have increased the concentration of this, this, this neurotransmitter slash chemical called osteoprotegerin, which is, which is why with, with CRPS, you see osteopenia. Okay. So you're not only dealing with, and that's why at a certain stage, we used to call it a bone atrophy or pseudex atrophy because it is also a bone issue, right? It's not only an issue with the nervous system, issue with the sympathetic system, in issue with the inflammatory markers. You see some form of osteopenia or later stages osteoporosis, okay? And whenever you're treating patients who are subacute and chronic, Always think in your mind this patient also has osteopenia, and X-rays will show it. Okay, they are not gold standard for CRPS. The gold standard is the criteria we discuss, but X-rays are important. Okay, let's talk about central sensitization and peripheral sensitization, and what is happening at a peripheral nervous system level and central nervous system level again. And we did we do talk about this stuff in our foundations lecture in a much more detail and much more and how we address central sensitization and peripheral sensitization in our foundations lecture. But we're gonna talk about, if you wanna read the research about behind it, there is a researcher, Dr. Nids from Belgium. He's done like tons of research on central sensitization, peripheral sensitization. We always recommend patient people to read the 2009 and 2011 article published by him. And he talks about what you should when you, especially like practical aspects of it, when you're talking to patients with central sensitization and peripheral sensitization, 
how should you approach it? If you want me to share those articles, we encourage people who are in cohort one and two to read about the, read those two articles. And we a lot of our central and peripheral sensitization treatment comes from his research. Okay. So what is happening here is you have in, activated more unimodal receptors, you have added more receptors here, and you have decreased threshold, increased magnitude. Okay. And what this is doing is, if this keeps going on, this is sending signals to your nervous system, right? And sending amplified signals, like you're getting like this amplified signals to the nervous system, but there's something terribly, terribly wrong in my hand. And then what happens is they start to have this, our brain is like kind of malleable, which means that it starts to, starts to adapt what is whatever is happening at a peripheral nervous system level, it starts to adapt. So what it does is at a at a central nervous system level, you because the symbol signals are too much, your somatosensory cortex, S1 primary somatosensory cortex and S2 secondary somatosensory cortex, you have like kind of a decrease in representation, which means simply means if this much area of the somatosensory cortex was was controlling controlling your limb or your wrist, now you have decreased representation. Okay, and that is pure neuroscience. We call it cortical reorganization. We call it synaptic plasticity, the various terms to it. So this that's why this is a very difficult condition to explain because everybody has contributed from their aspects and from their expertise to explain this and what is happening at a different level and what is happening at a neurogenetic level, what is happening. Okay, I'm gonna to try to explain this again and, and make a sense of it, okay? So you have, you have an injury here, and now we know that this injury, because of the amplified, all the peripheral sensitization, you're sending way more signals to the spinal cord, to the brain, right? And now you're getting your somatosensory cortex, which is your sensory cortex, which receives your afferent, okay? pathways into the brain is getting way more signals. What it does is your, your cortex starts to look differently. Your cortex starts to look differently. Your cerebral cortex, your somatosensory cortex starts to look differently. If I'm just giving you a random example, if this much area in the brain, maybe consider like a two inch of area was, was designated to supply this wrist, now you only have one inch of area that is designated to supply the wrist because of these amplified. So your brain starts to starts to change and starts to perceive this as a threat. I don't need this much of brain controlling this area because there are too many receptors here. Okay, and that is called as cortical reorganization. And the crazy part is. With, with PT treatment and physiotherapy treatment, you can reverse this. And we're gonna talk about that. And that's, the, that's, a, that's why rehab is fantastic if you understand what you're doing, yeah? yeah. And I'll give you some treatment ideas and, and, and you, can, you can reverse all this with rehab, yeah? Yeah. So you have these cortical changes, you have, you have stimulated the pain pathways, crazy, and then you have, reduce the representation of the affected limb. Yeah. The above changes are reversible with successful treatment, but it's, ab it's about your understanding, whether you're diagnosing it right, you're putting these patients in the right category and you're giving them, you're giving them correct treatment. Okay. Okay. Okay, uh, so talking about other factors that have shown to have a contributing factor to this condition is you certain people who have higher predisposition to depression, we know that people who are depressed, there is a genetic marker to it, okay? And then there is also a role of genetics with, with CRPS. I don't wanna make the words complex. There's something called as polymorphism, which means that there are like two discontinuous genes present 
which contribute to this diagnosis. And they have seen that they have like people with those two discontinuous genetic makeup are more predisposed to CRPS. Okay, so the simpler thing is there is a role of genetics in this. Okay, and people who are have some form of depression has higher. But if you look at it, this pa these patients are presented with physical changes, right? They're not just like, it's not all in their head. You can physically see it. You can see the sensory changes. You can see the vasomotor changes. You can see, you can, you can test the motor changes. You can see the changes in the skin, right? Okay. Any questions till now? And then we're going to go on to talk about the case studies. And case studies will make more sense. I mean, I think I, I picked in the, picked this article from University of Santiago, Chile, and it was published very recently. And they'd look at, they look at like, look at radius, radial, radial, radial fractures and radius K for joint and stuff like that. And deliberately I picked up that article because if you don't even understand 50% of what I've taught today, at least you will have like good treatment ideas. You'll do the, you'll pick up those small ideas from that case study and the treatment they used and you use the same treatment on a similar diagnosis and you'll probably not fail. You'll probably have like, those patients will have better outcomes, right? And your our, our understanding can sometimes improve with time, but the idea is that at least you pick up some treatment ideas from this lecture and you you apply that them on patients and patients get patients get better okay so we're going to talk about this case study and this case study is taken from this case series that was published in 2015 by university of san diego chile okay so your patient was 62 year old female who had a fall on the outstretched hand and had a close reduction okay Patient wore a cast for four weeks, weeks, but six weeks after the cast removal, she began, began experiencing the severe symptoms, especially here. Yeah. And then she had swelling, redness, shininess. Okay. And then you have deficits of fourth and fifth digit. Okay. And this patient was a part of that study. Okay. The study, the case series, when, whenever they're doing case series, they're looking at like multiple patients. They're not looking at just one patient. This was one of the patients in the study, but they are looking, they were looking at 54 patients who all of them had like radius fracture. Okay. So you have this group of patients with radius fractures, which they sampled over the period of time. And they most of them were like between 50 to 70 years of age and what had like some something similar patient presentation yeah yeah and patients came in all the patients were given like these standardized measure this questionnaire was given which was patient risk rated risk evaluation questions that's nothing but a questionnaire patient fills out and then also these the other questionnaires i always use in the clinic you have your upper extremity function with disabilities of arm okay and then dash questionnaire which is very standardized in foundations lecture, we talk about it, how to fill that out. Patients come in, you give them, okay? And then they did like a grip strength with the dynamometer, which I think is a standard measure just to give objectivity to the initial exam and then pain intensity, okay? So this was like an initial kind of a, just to get like some numbers because we want to give like objective, whenever you're doing research, you want to give objectivity to what we are doing, right? And this was the treatment that was given. And I'm going to talk a little more about manual therapy from manual therapy standpoint, what research says about manual therapy and how we should use manual therapy whenever we're teaching, treating patients with CRPS. So what they did was in this study that is research design was patients were treated twice a week for six weeks. So that everybody got like 12 sessions. These 54 patients got 12 sessions of treatment uh, two times a week for six weeks. Okay. And they were given like 15 minutes of exercises in the whirlpool, active range of motion exercises. Okay. Nothing fancy. Okay. Active range of motion exercises in the whirlpool. But from the manual from manual therapy standpoint, you have to look at what the grading was. They were using oscillatory techniques initial first week one and two. 
if I go back to there is an article by Bialski, 19, uh, 2018, he talks about whenever you're treating patients with CRPS, patients who have allodynia and hyperalgesia, the role of manual therapy is very limited within first, first, first two weeks. They did use some oscillatory techniques, but some of the case studies, some researches you'll read, the role of manual therapy for the first two weeks. So don't use a lot of hell lot of manual therapy when your patients have in first two weeks. Okay. And that's what I'm trying to what, what I'm trying to explain here. After two weeks, in this research design, they used more of like kind of a sustained approaches. Okay, both AP and PA. Okay. Both AP and PA, this is nothing but more sustained hold, long duration holds. Okay. And then they were doing some exercises. The exercises they selected were very interesting to me just because there is a whole science behind specifically choosing these exercises. And because scaphoid fracture, a radio fracture is very common and radio scaphoid joint involvement is very common. You can just pick up these exercise ideas because, and use that in the clinic and see if you find results with them, okay? Because there's a whole, whole science behind somatosensory reorganization. I'm, I'll try to explain it, but it can be a little complex. So what is happening here is the first exercise they used was they were asking patients to do like kind of a kind of a grip strength exercise, but they were getting a feed, visual feedback. They were getting a visual feedback how much they are pushing. So for example, I do a exercise and I push and I get like a reading like 10 newtons and I push again, I get like 10.5 and I get like, do it again, I get like 10.8. So what they were getting these visual feedback and why, why were they giving this visual pressure feedback? Because it activates a certain set of neurons in the brain called, called mirror neurons. Okay. And these mirror neurons, and that's why, that's the exact reason why you exercise in front of the mirror. Okay. Act, and these mirror neurons are higher in density in your S1 and S2, in your somatosensory cortex. Okay. And that's why we exercise in front of the mirror. So you, what you can do is you can take like a dynamometer, ask the patient to contract. And every time they contract, you tell them the number, give them the visual feedback and, or they can look at it. Okay. Or they can look at it, how much they are squeezing. Okay. And that activates... So mirror neurons in the somatosensory cortex. And with research, we know that somatosensory cortex is misrepresenting the hand or the site of injury with the literature, right? Little complex. Okay. And another exercise they used was kind of a reverse throwing exercises where they were asking the patient to like target a dart. Looks a little silly but they're still using visual feedback because they're looking at the target and they're throwing it. The idea is same, activating mirror neurons. And I think that was, that's why I selected this study because when we talk about cortical reorganization in S1, S2, and we talk about these exercises, these exercises are not just improving range of motion or strength here. These exercises are targeting the neurons in the brain, okay? And of course, they did some scapular retraction exercises. You can do it in front of the mirror. You can do all these exercises in the front of the mirror, but third, definitely you can do it. And first and second. So when you, whenever you're treating patients, make sure that you can use these exercises. And that's the whole point. Very little manual therapy in, in week one and two. Little more manual therapy from week three to week six. Okay. And after that, you, you, your manual therapy can become a little more progressive and you can use these exercises. Yeah. Trying to without complicate things. If you have radius patient with radius fracture, try these exercises as simple as that. If you don't understand mirror neurons, I can teach a lecture on one hour lecture on mirror, mirror, mirror neurons. I think let's not go there. All we're trying to say is that when you do exercises like this, it changes how the brain functions and you're trying to reorganize the brain again. Yeah. Okay. Let's look at the data, what they found. Okay. You had, they, they filled out these questionnaires initially. You had this patient 
related risk questionnaire the baseline was if you know the statistics look at the p values on the right of the screen We're going to talk about a case study on the lower extremity after this. So just to address your question, I, I deliberately selected an upper extremity case study and a lower extremity case study. Okay. And, and that uh, and the treatment used was very different. So I'm going to talk about an upper extremity because how our lower extremity is represented in our brain is very different from our, how our upper extremity is represented in our brain. Okay. So we're going to talk about some treatment ideas. Okay. Yes, neuroplastical cortical reorganization. I think re neuroplasticity and cortical reorganizations can be used interchangeably. The terms cortical reorganization is usually a uh, cortical reorganization usually a kind of a representation that something has gone wrong uh, in the peripheral nervous system. Neuroplasticity is usually a response to rehab. But it is technically changing the changing the synaptic pathways. Okay, visual feedback activates whenever you have a somatosensory cortex involvement. We can you be used in visual feedback just because it activates mirror neurons. Okay, and helps with cortical reorganization. And I can teach a one-hour lecture on mirror, mirror neurons, but I mean that's a, we, we, let's not get there because I think let's let's talk about what we have here. Okay, so you have. Dash, you have BAS, everything improved. You can look at the p-values on the right of the screen. Everything is less than 0.05, except the grip strength. So you, you're seeing this improvement. You're seeing this improvement in, in pain, which is why we buy patients come to us. Improvement in, in, in DASH questionnaire. DASH questionnaire is nothing but various functional activities put together. And then you have patient rated risk evaluation questionnaire, which is also patient's perception of their symptoms. So patient's perception of the symptoms improved, patient's function improved, pain improved. Okay. And and that and that's why this was, I think, a beautiful article. Okay. You can just take like I would I would just take some ideas from this case case series. And if you next time you see a patient with complex regional pain syndrome at least use some of the similar exercises and some of the similar concepts of manual therapy. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about case study two. One of you were talking about lower extremity. I'm going to talk about this case report published. It's a beautiful case report published at by University of St. Augustine, St. Marcus, California. And they talk about especially with like lower extremity, the common cause is either a, either an ankle sprain or a sprain of a ligament in around the foot and foot surgeries be the causative factor for CRPS in the foot. Yeah. So our patient is a 61 year old female who represented a physical therapy with right foot pain. She underwent surgery for Morton's neuroma a few months earlier. Yeah, three months earlier. Okay. And then she's wearing the soft boot, has a poor walking pattern, intalgic gait pattern, unable to wear socks, drive, wait wear for longer than 15 minutes. Most patients would go to a pain doctor in this situation, would have a sympathetic blocker, and the symptoms did not improve in this patient. Okay. And when symptoms don't improve, patients come to us. Okay. So this is a good example of good case case report of somebody who has a lower extremity CRPS. Yeah. Yeah. What were the subjective findings? 10 on 10 pain with activity and weight bearing. Patient reported severe symptoms. That's why patient is using a boot. 7 on 10 pain at rest. We like to, in US, I think with all the lower extremity foot knee problems, they use lower extremity functional questionnaire, which they used. Patients scored 10 on 80, which is 12.5% or 87% disability. And the disability score is more than 80%, we call it, call it severe disability. So this patient presented with severe disability on a lower extremity functional score, okay? And this is, in research, we do these so that we can give like objectivity 
to uh, to patient's symptoms or patient's finance. Yeah, this is how the foot looked like on day one. You can look at the right and you can look at the left. Clear difference, right? Absolutely flushed, warm, red, shiny, swollen. Okay, on day one. And then this was a treatment given to this patient. This patient was treated for eight weeks, twice a week. And these are the some, you can actually take a picture of the slide so that you can use some of these treatment ideas. And I'm going to talk about the data and don't talk about, I'm going to show you pictures at week six and week eight. And you will see the difference. Okay. So I did not spend a lot of time on graded exposure therapy or desensitization, which I can in this lecture, but because of the shortage of time, and at some point I'm probably going to do a lecture on mirror neurons, desensitization, grade exposure therapy, all of these different things individually, because there is a lot of research out there. There's a lot of articles being published. Desensitization is nothing but you're using like, using different textures, starting from, from like a soft textures to kind of rough textures. Are you trying to decrease your, this is another way of cortical reorganization or creating that neuroplastic response in the somatosensory cortex. This study also did like, the, the, the research design was such that they used like some form of affleurage to reduce swelling in, in both week one, two, week three, six, and week seven, eight, okay? Great exposure is nothing but because the lower extremity problem, you're trying to create like proprioceptive inputs by doing weight bearing, okay? And if you look at the research design, because a lot of research says that no manual therapy in week one, two, they did not use manual therapy in the first two weeks. Okay. And they did a lot of nerve glides. If you look at the dosimetry of nerve glides, the dosimetry of nerve glides is very, very little. Only 10 repetitions. In neurodynamics, we talk about this stuff all the time. If you attended, if you are from cohort one or two, or if, if you're part of gem master class, we, in neurodynamics, we talk about how to select the dosimetry for the nerve because it's very easy to make the nerve angry. In CRPS2, you can have a nerve involvement, right? You can have those changes in nerve conduction findings, okay? I, if I was you, I would take a picture of the slide and when I see my patient, I would use some of the similar approaches because this is, I think, we're gonna, I know this is a, only a case report, but I think this is good, good summary of treatment you can use in your patients, okay? You can look at manual therapy. Manual therapy become, they started doing some manual therapy, grade two to grade four, plantar and dorsal glides for MTPs, one into five reps for five second holds, week three to six. And week seven to eight, they did like more sustained manual therapy. This is very similar to the previous case report we, we spoke about more sustained manual therapy, okay? And, and then they did this right and left discrimination. And what they, how you do is, I mean, you ask the patient to close the eyes and you touch each leg and you ask them this right leg or left leg. Okay, and that, that sometimes you can do, or you can hide one leg behind the mirror and then ask the patient to close their eyes and touch it, okay? They were given like home exercise program, desensitization, ROM, neural mobilizations, and then more standing exercises were added in, to home exercise program. And then gait training was also added. Okay. This was a kind of approach that was used in the, in the case study. Let's look at what the outcomes were. At eight weeks of therapy, pain was three to five, from seven to 10 to three to five with activity. So pain was 10, 10 on 10. And our pain is three to five. I, this is only a case report, but the pain improved. Okay, pain improved. Whenever we look at the visual analog scale, we are always looking at a difference of two. I can explain the right and right and left discrimination is nothing but you ask the patient to close the eyes and you touch each 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 foot and you check which it is. Your patient will tell you this is right, this is left. That's what right and left discrimination is. Can patient discriminate between they are affected side and they are unaffected side. And there is a whole science why sometimes they can't. There's a whole science why, because of the sensory reorganization, 
a lot of patients won't be able to tell you with, without visual feedback. And that's why some of the exercises we use, we use visual feedback. Because this right and left discrimination is gone. Though they have symptoms of hyperalgesia on the site of injury. Right? And so that's why this is kind of a, that's why this is called complex regional pain because some of the stuff is a little complex. Okay? But you can always take like exercise ideas, treatment ideas, and even if you don't understand a lot of neurophysiology, what is happening, at least you know the crux of it and you know this works, right? And this should, I, I, sometimes you don't need to know the neurophysiology and neuroscience behind it. You need to have like kind of ideas about exercises to use, okay? And I, uh, treatment ideas to use, right? Okay. So at eight weeks, they found the visual analog scale to be three on five, which is greater than two. Because for VAS or NRPS, we always look at two as a difference. Lower extremity functional scale went from 10 to 38. 12.5 to 47.5, significantly better. Okay. When we talk about clinical significant difference, going back to the foundation's lecture, we're always at looking at a difference of 10. Here, the difference is almost, almost 28. Okay. How did the foot look like? Week two, week four, and week eight. This is week four. This is week eight. Yeah. Stark difference from week one. Right. So that's why I like this article because, I mean, and that's why I thought this was this was like good results, and you can you can definitely. Take ideas from ideas from this research, and because this pub, this study was published by a university, there there is a lot more scrutiny when a university publishes a study. Okay, you can't you can't fake results like the ads you see on Instagram or or you see on social media. Okay, there's a lot lot more scrutiny. Icing can be useful. There is swelling, but I don't think they use they use effleurage. Okay. And you can see week, I don't know, week eight looked like almost normal, right? Okay. So the point is, it doesn't matter whether it's acute or chronic, treat it and treat it accurately and use the research ideas we have. The, good, the beautiful thing is these days we have so much, so much research available, so much research ideas available so that we can use it and actually help our patients, right? Probably back in the day, we did not have a lot of Contrast bath, all the all the, all the literature I looked at, I don't think there is a lot of evidence. You can use it, I mean, but I mean, I don't, I don't, I did not find a whole lot of research, CRPS and contrast bath. Yeah, I think especially in the U.S., the trend of using modalities has just gone away because there have ins insurance companies feel like threatened when they because the research on all the modalities is just very limited. Yeah, and insurance companies don't pay for it because long term they don't help. Using heat therapy and swelling, you might, but I don't. I don't think research. There's a lot of evidence for that as well. Yeah. But why manual therapy? So I'm going to talk a little bit about about this, and we are teaching a manipulations course in few weeks. I think two weeks from now. Can patients tolerate effluid? So this is, a, yeah, that's a good question. So this is what very light pressure they used. And sometimes all patients have like sensitive spots. You have to just avoid those sensitive spots. They use very light pressure and they were also doing desensitization and the pressure increased. Okay. And if you look at week seven and eight, they are using manual mirroring. They're doing massage in front of a mirror. Same somatosensory reorganization, activating those mirror neurons. Yeah. 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 This is some, some, some slides, some information. I'm going to try to dumb it down. So this is the mechanism that was
yes, light pressure, but you also have your goal is to like goal is to decrease swelling and the sedative effect is good at that stage, probably. So I'll try to simplify this and try to, I think I have I have slides, future slides, which talk about what manual therapy actually does, what manipulations actually does. So you're providing a mechanical stimulus to the tissue and your goal is to improve range of motion and decrease spasm. And you're activating, a, activating the peripheral nervous system. You're activating inflammatory mediators. You're, you're activating spinal cord. Okay, and you're also activating Yeah. What it is doing is it is changing the motor neuron pool. It is changing the firing pattern. If you have attended our lectures, we talk about, we talk about, we sometimes activate, manipulate L4, L5 to shut down TFL or turn on posterior glute med. What are you looking for? Uh, if affected extremity put what level of higher level of heart? How many chances of good result? What what do you mean by higher level of heart? Can you rephrase your question, please? What is uh? Can you rephrase your questions? Question, please. This is the question you're asking. Can you rephrase this question? I didn't get your question. The higher level of heart. Yeah, please rephrase your question so that I can I can comment on it. The so double limb elevation. You can do limb elevation. Yeah, elevation. Are you elevation? You can do limb elevation if you want to do swelling. I'm just giving you and I'm, I'm just giving you what is there in research. Yeah, you can do limb elevation. There's no there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, if you're if that's if you're trying to reduce swelling, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, few stages, but I mean, the swelling here is not because it's 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 the swelling here is different. It is an autonomic nervous system dysfunction. Yeah, yeah. So basically, what you're getting is when we're doing manipulations, the manual therapy, you you're getting this change in motor neural neuron pool, change in efferent discharge, and the change in muscle activity. I was giving an example of L4, L5 and glute mid activation, TFL inhibition. Okay. Sometimes you get this temporal summation and that produces hypo-LGCR. Temporal summation is you get this increased firing because of pain, which we were talking about. You do a manipulation or you do a manual therapy technique and then you get this absolute shutdown of the activity. Okay. Yeah. And then... Some of the pain get stuff is still there. You have this release of beta endorphins, opioid response, okay? And then there is, because when you move or when you have increased facilitation, you have decreased kinesophobia, kinesophobia, you have decreased fear, you're moving better and definitely it has like a modulatory, of, it has like a kind of a placebo effect as well, okay? We'll talk about another mechanistic model and we'll try to dumb it down. So what exactly happened? So this is a very, very complex model, but I'll try to explain what manual therapy actually do, okay? So I'm the provider and I'm doing, I'm, I'm the provider, I'm doing a mechanical stimulus on a patient, right? And that is, that is zone one, okay? When I do manipulation or manual therapy, I, create some changes in pain modulatory circuitry because we know that especially with CRPS, the you you're, you're have like kind of an impaired pain perception, okay? With manual therapy, what I'm doing is I'm modulating the pain circuitry and I'm doing kind of some sensory reorganization as well. I'm create, when I first, I think when I first manipulate or do like manual therapy, a uh, question there. What is FDM? FDM manual skill is it? What is FDM? What is can you can you say FDM? What is FDM? Okay. So you have zone one, you have zone two. 
functional distortion model. I don't, I don't, I don't think facial distortion model. I don't think facial distortion model has a lot of research backing to it, but yeah. Yeah, I don't think it has a lot of research backing to it. People who believe in fascia, fascia, I know there are a lot of osteopaths that come to India and teach this stuff, but there is, there is very, very little research backing it. I know a lot of people say we can hydrate the fascia, re dehydrate the fascia, and that will improve symptoms. I mean, from evidence-based standpoint, I think that is a very poor explanation. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about zone one, what is exactly happening. And I'm, I'm discussing this because we might discuss this again in a manual therapy lecture in much more detail two weeks from now. But I'm, I'm trying to explain this, what is the context behind it. So if I'm the provider and I'm giving the manual therapy to a patient or manual therapy to a tissue, the factors that the factors that affect what kind of manual therapy that patient will receive is usually my clinical experience, my clinical reasoning, my pain beliefs, my expectation, my expertise. Okay, and that's why the program is designed because. These four things make a huge difference in how you how you perceive. Same thing with CRPS. We used to perceive it as a bone problem, muscle problem. Now we know that it has a multifactorial etiology affecting the somatosensory cortex. Okay, so you have this physical physical stuff going on here. Your peripheral nervous system is getting involved. Then your central nervous system is getting involved. And with manual therapy and the approaches we discussed earlier, we can reverse all this. Yeah. And now you have the patient. Patient has also has a context, what they can what they know about their condition, what is their preference, what their belief system is. And when we talk about evidence-based model, we always respect patients' belief system. You get patients who don't want you to do manual, manual therapy in them, and but you still want to produce this change you're trying to produce, right? In the in their in their pain behavior, in their response. Okay. Yeah. So this is zone one, okay? And this mechanistic model has given a lot of a lot of focus or a lot of importance to providers' expertise, pain beliefs, clinical experience, and expectations. Because you have a certain expectations that if you do A, you're going to get a response B. And response B, we are usually always looking for a favorable response, okay? When you do that, what happens? You change, you're trying to modulate the pain pathways. You're trying to create like opiate response. You're trying to create this, change this pain circuitry. Okay. And this pain circuitry is, is the problem, especially when we talk about chronic pain or when we talk about CRPS. Okay. And then you, if you look at this, this is the important part. At the spinal cord level, you're creating, you're changing this autonomic response. Okay, you're changing the skin temperature, you're changing the skin conductance. Research says they decrease the cortisol level, you, you decrease the heart rate. All this is impaired in patients with CRPS. Okay, and that's why manual therapy is important. Okay, and that's why manual therapy is important. It's not changing the firing pattern at the spinal cord level, not only changing the brain activation, okay, you can not creating, also creating somatosensory evoked potentials, which means that change, causing some form of reorganization, cortical reorganization, but also changing the autonomic nervous system, which we are worried about when we are talking about CRPS. Okay. And I always talk about increase in motor neuron pool. We increase the muscle activity because we know that pain inhibits muscle activity. Right. And we cause increase in nerve growth factors like cytokines, neuropeptides, and nerve growth factors. Okay, and all this helps in pain. They are pain mediators, right? Sorry, if this is complex. I'm going to share this on the YouTube. But I mean, if we want to be an expert and we call us our call us our program, we're trying to make expert manual therapist. You guys need to know this because you need to know what is happening at each level. What changes are you? creating at midbrain. And then we're going to talk about our talk about this stuff in our uh, manipulations lecture. We're going to talk about this again. And this is like 
Very recent research published in 2018. Okay, and, uh, and this is actually to educate manual therapists so that we know what we are doing, right? And at certain point, we are using this to, to help different patient problems. Yeah. Yeah. So talking about zone three, so you had interaction with the patient in the zone one, you created this modulatory changes at different level, at autonomic nervous system level, at a somatosensory cortex level, at a brain level, at a spinal cord level. And then you are seeing the response, the physical response in zone three, which is decrease in pain sensitivity. And that is what we look for, right? We look for decrease in pain sensitivity so that the threshold to pain goes up. Okay, we're trying to inhibit pain. So the threshold to those, the firing pattern goes down and the threshold goes up. And what it does is it causes pain relief. The clinical outcomes are better. Pay better satisfaction okay? and less resting pain. Okay. okay. Any questions, guys? I think this was the last slide. I know this was a very, very heavy lecture. Okay. And I will share this. We will share this on YouTube. And I know this was a critical lecture, but I mean, I can spend time talking about some glides on the digits and some glides on the foot, but we do talk about that stuff in greater detail in our upper extremity and lower extremity lecture. But I mean, if you want to go back and listen to it and relook at the slide, take some pictures so that you can use those treatment ideas, treatment ideas in your day-to-day -day practice, please do, because this is, this is hardcore research, a lot of recent literature, a lot of important information which you can use to help your patients. And that's why, how do you differentiate between compartment syndrome and CRPS? I think CRPS is one of the only conditions where you'll find like allodynia and hyperalgesia. Compartment syndrome, you would not find a allodynia and hyperalgesia. Compartment syndrome, you can have like an objective measure. I think they put like Biggs catheter and if the finding is too much, I think they, they, there is a, there's a separate criteria for compartment syndrome. There is no radiological test or imaging or a specific or a blood marker for CRPS. If you're suspecting CRPS, you're looking for the signs, symptoms, and you're looking for pain. Okay. Yeah. So going back to this criteria, Budapest criteria, I think this is the gold standard. This is the gold standard. So make sure that you're looking at this criteria. Okay. Uh, I think reach out to Dr. Bhumi. I think you can, she, she, she will make sure that you guess, guys get this like, I mean, more than my treatment idea is use the treatment ideas from this lecture. So you don't think this from like a physical standpoint, think this from cortical reorganization standpoint, think this from diagnostic stand, what are you, what are you, how are you diagnosis, diagnosing it? What, what, what changes manual therapy do? If you have been attending the, our lectures pre previously, you would know where we are coming from more than, because we try, I, I try to simplify, simplify it, but this is a very complex. We're gonna post it on YouTube. You can go back and relook at it, okay? And I think our, our, our profession is a very rapidly evolving profession. I think TENS has like some evidence, but internal nerve stimulation device is, a, is, is an answer, but I mean, but not everybody can get like a pain stimulator. I don't know whether that's a good idea in like a short term. I'm kind of, I beg to differ on that. I mean, but yeah, TENS, I mean, I think recent literature doesn't say, doesn't say TENS is a great idea. Maybe short term, yes. 
but whenever they're looking at like looking at long term out they all they're always looking at long term outcomes i don't know if long term outcomes are good with tens at least that's what evidence says yeah. yeah i the idea is i hope you learned something from this lecture but it's a it's a little complex lecture but i think it's an important information and even if looking at certain pictures looking at like treatment ideas if, if, if you can apply that on your patients, on your on some of the exercises, some of the act, activation of mirror neurons, I think this was worth doing it. Yeah, even if you can help like one patient, I think that, that would be good. Yeah. I'm gonna stick around for like five to 10 more minutes. If you have any questions, I'll take those questions and then I can probably call it a day. Are concepts like caring or scrubbing movements? Yes, we spoke about desensitization. You can definitely use like desensitization. I'm actually, I mean, uh, I mean, talking about the curriculum. You talking about you guys talking about the curriculum? PGT outdated by what is PGT? I think our if you talk, I, I graduated from University of Delhi back in 2008. I can tell you the pain gate theory you're talking about. Okay. So I think pain gate theory has been out loud. It's similar to similar to the problem with science is that science keeps evolving. And we developed this pain gate theory and we blamed it on everything on the nervous system that these areas of the brain get activated when we stimulate these receptors, right? That is pain gate theory. But we know that pain is not a uni unifactorial etiology. Pain is a multifactorial etiology. It is affected by other, syst other bodily systems, right? So that's why pain gate theory is, was a found, good foundation by Meckles and Wall, Melzick and Wall. And, but now they, I think they use a theory called neurometrics theory of pain, where they talk about various bodily system impacting pain, yeah? And coming back to the point I was trying to come back to, I graduated from University of Delhi and I think what I studied back in 2008 when I graduated, they still teach that same stuff. So our curriculum is as outdated as pain gate theory. It's like me teaching you reflex sympathetic dystrophy and not talking about complex regional pain syndrome. I can write it. Neurometrics theory of pain. We can do a lecture on it at some point. This was, I think, heavy enough. That's that's the new concept, and this is still evolving. The research keeps evolving and I mean, research keeps evolving and I think our curriculum, I think people who like just graduated from PT school, I just have to give you this insight that don't, don't keep using those outdated methods because the, I think the profession, the research has just moved along so well and I don't want to like sell our program, but I mean, we, we, that's why we do teach the program, okay? Because I think the, the, the science has changed so much. I mean, the way I used to practice has changed so much and it is, GOSPT comes up with these new ideas every, every, every month and they publish the school research and we just wanna make sure that we are, we are giving the best care we can to our patients, right? We're treating them because research is just evolving at a, such a rapid rate and I think the idea is that we should keep up with the research. A lot of people are teaching different things, but at least look at the evidence. You know, I mean, what evidence says, what what research says. I think sometimes, sometimes that's a great idea. Yeah. Any questions you have, guys? Thank you for joining in. This will be on YouTube, YouTube, so you guys can relook relook at it if you have time. Uh, you can take some pic pictures of the slides. I mean, some of the treatment ideas. Definitely, you can use this class. This cl criteria on this, on the screen right now is very very good. And I mean, you can use this criteria as well. 
Why female is more common? I think that is the question. I don't 